Uh, yeah, my goodness. Uh, well, what what I find problematic in in design is that it's hardly relating to what's happening in the real world. Huh? Uh, um, yeah, Quentin Quentin Crisp. Uh, yeah, uh, he, this uh, uh, English guy who lived in uh, New York. Uh, he was asked what will uh, if he believed in postmodernism. Then he said, "Well, after modernism, things only got worse." So I believe it's that, and I believe through the, the success of failure is to to achieve failure, and to to simply um, yeah go 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 as uh, as uh, bad and worse as possible to um, mm, yeah expand that that small represented uh, spectrum that the that Dutch design is nowadays. Mm. To explore more genres, so to say. <clears throat> if you consider Dutch design or design in general, I would say it's a, it's a romantic comedy yeah? mm. as, as a genre. So then there's no documentary, there's no stoner comedy, uh, there's no uh, science fiction, no horror, no exploitation, no B film, no C film. Uh, and the, uh, what what happens in Hollywood with all these genres uh, is that all these uh, journalists or people who write about it that are very smart, they, they write about everything. Huh? They don't make a distinction between, oh, that's the, the interesting independent film or so. They do the independent film and they do Piranha 3D, uh, for example. So then uh, what happens with, with these genres is that it's addressing the world and it's, a, it's a trying to, to understand uh, or not necessarily making us aware on where this world is going to, uh, as in science fiction is always uh, addressing uh, the present uh, in, instead of the future. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I believe that, that that should be the role of the designer. Okay, so where do you fall in that? Uh, the B film. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I would consider myself a B film. Yeah, Making something uh, uh, purposely bad and awful and terrible. Yeah. Uh, for this, yeah, this is for the uh, Lea Luke's furniture factory. Uh, for these 500 people who are working there, and uh, the guys who do the upholstery for Lea Luke's uh, or do product development, they drive the biggest cars. Uh, and um, the guy who gave me the tour, he was referring to the company uh, in talking to car metaphors. So he would say. Leolux is all about producing the BMW and the Audi, and uh, that's what we do really well. That's our core business, uh, and we're not making Maseratis, because that's such a niche yeah, that's done so well anyhow, uh, that, it's, uh, that, that we're not going to do it. Um, yeah, and then, then along the tour at one point, when we got from one building to the other on the parking place, there were these uh, black skid marks. Um, from probably these upholsters who had fun with their car and he commented actually on this administrative person there driving the new BMW as, as well so, so it's this, this whole car fascination mentality yeah so and, and they have a big problem uh, in their company is not getting enough free publicity uh, and they're they're a little bit yeah, annoyed about it, I would I would say, as in they're, they're paying lots of uh, editorial space every every month for various magazines. Um, yeah, so taking that all into account, uh, what I will say is that well, you don't need to make the Maserati, but you can make the Lamborghini, uh, and that this will be a more abstractized version of it, uh, and not necessarily as a as a sofa, but more as a sitting object or as a big stool. If this is scale wanted, it's a huge uh, stool, and then of course this this comes out of uh, you know boys uh, sleeping in their car bed, for example, beds in the form of cars, um, and then next to that you have cars that are being converted into sofas as well. So there's a very specific need for these these boys or men, uh, or it's the the Lamborghini keychain, for example. Yeah, you pursue the car, but you will never get the car. They will never, most likely, never ever get a Lamborghini, but I would say that they can sit on it. Yeah, yeah translated in, in Dutch, we have a word for it, spullen. 
En uh, spullen, ja, uh, translates to stuff. Stuff. Ja, yeah, is in what would you gain from, from uh, specifying it or giving it more value or uh, meaning? Huh? That, that could be a, a general need from designers as well, is to make their profession really interesting, meaningful. Um, they, they want to get the feeling that it's not for, for nothing, their, their life. Uh, whether it's it's music or design or architecture uh, to a meaning salvation redemption yeah the moment i graduated this was in 1998 uh, the Dutch design came up, huh? so it, it was it was getting there. So the Marcel Wanders, the Jurgen Bij, uh, Bert Jan Pot, uh, and so forth. They, they came up, and I really had no idea why. Uh, as in, uh, uh, yeah, I studied at uh, Willem de Koning Academy, and I studied my history, and I thought, well, you know, this is what's being made before, and now all of a sudden we have these these objects or these products. All of a sudden, it 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 simply didn't add up for me. Uh, is it a publicity wise as well of course something had to be solved so there were many um, I would say powers or institutions in place that were promoting Dutch design and this is nothing new because uh, Dutch design is being promoted for many 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 years I would say for, for 80 years now that's that's been institutionalized huh? um, yeah the um, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, they have all these embassies around the world and every four years a new ambassador gets appointed. There are cultural attaches uh, as well in place. And uh, through this, this network, um, wh whenever a new ambassador is appointed, he wants to open something or he needs to open something to show his friends and relations and say, well, this is what Dutch culture is, is all about and therefore uh, there needs to be an exhibition that is promoting Dutch culture. Uh, and then mostly the focus now, or since Droog, huh, was uh, on, on design. Um, and uh, what, what happens from there <coughs> is that there's a, there's a need, huh? so there, there's a market for Dutch design promoting Dutch culture. Uh, because these embassies, they want to have those, those objects or those design objects and want to make exhibitions with them because they need to introduce this new ambassador. Uh, and then from there, uh, of course, uh, it, it's not only the exhibition, but it's uh, uh, yeah, from the Department of Economic Affairs, there are all these trade missions as well. So lots of politicians and companies surrounding this uh, paying uh, for, for it as well to make this all possible. Now, what uh, what happened through this yeah, demand, uh, so to say, is that there's simply a demand for, for, the, for the object, huh? or for, for the new, so to say. And uh, uh, at the same time, because yeah, I would say is that the money comes from economical affairs for the, for the most part. There are no curators involved, there are no specialists involved, there are no design historians involved in making those exhibitions uh, that are promoting uh, Dutch culture, uh, there was simply no room for criticism whatsoever because it all had to be pretty uh, and not uh, and comfortable. Huh? Um, yeah. So then, in a sense, it really doesn't matter what what you make for for these exhibitions huh? if you supply uh, the the created demand. Uh, yeah, what, what it's getting to <clears throat> nowadays, I would say, is that all these, these sweatshops are opening all over the Netherlands uh, with Design Academy graduates, uh, designers themselves, they need, or even my students uh, uh, that are having this academic degree, they know uh, how to work as a designer, they're quite smart, and then the, the work they're doing basically all day long is polishing and sanding for these designers to make these elaborate, very costly uh, objects. Now, uh, when you go back to the, the Wiener Werkstätte, uh, for example, or the, through the ceramic process, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Huh? You cast something, 
you glaze it and then you're done. Uh, you sand a little bit or so. Uh, making these one one offs, uh, that's that's totally fine. But it's a, uh, I would say a, a romanticized idea uh, of what what the craft is actually about. Um. So, the, so the craft in itself is way more efficient huh, than uh, than what these uh, design academy alumni are, are doing now. But uh, yeah, in a sort of larger context, um, yeah, if you consider uh, the yeah, uh, you know you you want to have a better profession as your father, uh, and that's that's something you want to achieve. So my father was uh, uh, he worked for Philips. Huh? Uh, making these really uh, yeah, technical uh, parts for, for machines and he could do it really well. <clears throat> but of course I didn't want to do it, I want to get higher on the social ladder. But now there's this movement is that these uh, sons of lawyers uh, are saying, well, I, d I don't want to be a lawyer anymore, I want to start my own bakery because I want to bake bread. So that's going to make me happy and I don't want to work in an office the rest of my life. So that's, that's, I would say, the, the larger context of it. This need for yeah, making stuff by hand. So there, there's a, I would say, there's a need for authenticity. Huh? Uh, so something uh, needs to look authentic in order for it to exist, because designers think that people might relate to it. Uh, and then uh, the authentic part that something should be handmade or that it should rather look like it's handmade. So it doesn't need to be handmade, but it can be mass produced, uh, but even look uh, handmade. Yeah, of course, that, that falls apart in, in different categories as well. Then there's the, 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 the objects that are screaming for uh, attention, that want to be new, huh? so it, it's new and then therefore it can exist, or it can only exist that it's new and then there's a need for new. These, all these magazines need to, be, uh, need to be sold, of course. So there's a, there's a reproductive value uh, of that particular product as well. Huh? It can be a one-off, uh, it can be a one-of-a-kind, one, one uh, but through these magazines it, it's, uh, it's being reproduced uh, as well, even though it's not a mass-produced uh, product. So uh, yeah, yeah. I would say it's a suggestion and an illusion. Huh? It's a marketing tool. I wouldn't say it's it's anything more than that. There's a, there's a general need for for all of us to to get the authentic feeling, right? to to get to, yeah redemption, salvation through the use of this product. And then this this product will promise you exactly this. And of course, uh, it doesn't. Huh? Uh, and then therefore I would say there's, there's a, a failure w within the object, eh? not, not living up to these expectations that the product is, is promising you. Yeah, yeah when, when I entered the, the product world, so to say, and uh, sort of getting out of the, the virtual, uh, I found that most of the Dutch design that I saw wasn't designed uh, according to the, yeah, the, the modernist uh, view uh, or the modernist belief on what the product should be like, uh, as in that it should be consistent and uh, pure, yeah, pure. Um, in Dutch, it's named cyber. Um, so that translates and says that w what you see is what you get. Uh, and uh, with this, these particular design pieces, uh, or the, well, this is very uh, uh, according to the, the old modernist. <coughs> Uh, a philosophy on it, it's not pure, huh? and then therefore it's a, it becomes a, a prop or, or a set piece, is that it's uh, communicating something that it's not. <clears throat> and it's the same with, those, with the Helling Ogerius phase. Huh? It's uh, the, the, the glass part is a, a lid, huh? you, you cannot use it functionally. And therefore it's, te it's uh, glued together with silicone kit that is hidden by putting this tape uh, on it. Uh, for these, uh, the, the Richard Hutte, you know, yeah, you can see it is that there's some, some major construction work underneath this chair. Uh, it's suggesting that it's, that it's pure, that, it's, that, that you see what you get until you turn it around. So this is really where, where I decided to, to cut up these various pieces to, to expose the, the failure uh, of, of the object and sell them half price. So half, I have to design for half the price. 
Two books were written uh, or were uh, edited by Frederike Huygen, uh, which um, focuses on 100 years of Dutch design, on how it uh, uh, got all started, uh, that it uh, derived from the craft, or it split from the, from the craft. And then at one point, uh, or uh, during those two books, uh, every time uh, this one designer or factory owner or architect is preaching any sort of new modernism huh, or any new take on what mo modernity should, should be about. Um, then uh, in, in this book, it's quite nice. Then after this is published, other people get in and say, well, you, or, you know, you, you you cannot say this. Huh? There's an alternative to it. So this happened over the course uh, of a, of a hundred years, uh, and then at some point uh, in this book, uh, the designers agree amongst themselves. Is that design is mostly is that the, the prototype in itself is not design, but the reproduction of it. So I, for a product design, I, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if this were a prototype, then that's not design. But if it's being reproduced, then you, you need to consider this, this whole array of, of other yeah, limitations, uh, rules, uh, technical problems, and so forth, in order to reproduce it. And when it's reproduced, or when it's reproducible, uh, then you can talk about design. Ah, yeah, the, the rip-offs. Um, after my graduation, I, or in my graduation project, I uh, wrote everything down that I ate and uh, I scanned in the results the morning after and I made 3D scans out of it. And uh, so I graduated on my own uh, shit, so, so, so to say, to make these really nice 3D architectural models. And then in virtual space, they can exist either on a product scale, architectural scale, interior scale, landscape uh, scale. And from there on, I, I was quite intrigued in not yeah, rethinking the design process and not starting with uh, mood boards or uh, an idea huh? uh, or, uh, and then start sketching, product development, sanding, thinking, well, it can be two millimeters more to the left or should we study on that form, et cetera, et cetera. It was a, a very tedious process. And I thought, well, uh, if I, because I did that on in, in virtual space for quite some time is to set parameters for a certain process and then from there on form would be, be generated. Um, and then at, at some point I thought, well, what could this mean in, in the product world? Eh? This, this particular concept in setting these parameters, very uh, set of strict rules, following them. And then from there on these, these forms or these designs would, would simply just be there. And it consists out of five known and five less known designers. And um, yeah, they're, they're bad copies, the, or the, the result is a bad copy. Uh, they're spray painted, the, the colored ones, there's a white and a black uh, version. The white version has a uh, day glow transfers uh, decals uh, on it. Um, yeah, there was this watering can that was 50 cents that I bought and that turned all to 95 euros. I said that the, the price for all of them 95 euros a piece. Uh, but nobody, or in the press, it, it wasn't uh, noted at, at all. So I thought it was the most perverse thing to do. Uh, but everybody focused on, on this one right here, or the, the ripoff of the Leon Giris vase. Uh, and the Vicky Somers vase as well, that's right there. Um, and yeah, this, this, the, the collection was e immediately bought by the Museum Boymans van Beuningen, uh, though the originals are not in their collection. And it, yeah, it turned out to be this huge controversy. Uh, that was not, uh, or it, it wasn't my intention to do so. Uh, yeah, in, in my view, it, it was uh, yeah, doing something I've, I've always done since, since my graduation, just to, to start this process. To, to initiate a, a process, rethinking the, the conventional design process. I, I had a hunch on what I wanted to do with this class, and then as soon as, as I got the grant, or that I knew that I got the grant, I started studying everything glass, and I, I wanted to know everything uh, about it.
Uh, you buy books, you study it, you visit museums, and um, uh, you turn the, 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 the subject upside down. Well, it, ca it came out of the ceramic uh, series prequels, uh, where I got these existing hobby molds and made mold parts around it, uh, and then, yeah, um, get get the, the actual form of the mold in it uh, as well, so connecting one mold of one form with another mold of another form. Uh, and from there on, I thought, well, this should be possible in glass as well, to, to get the, the space between the form, uh, to uh, yeah, morph, morph the form in a sense on what's technically possible. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I did with these Royal Whip-Offs. And um, yeah, with each kind of glass, because I used 10, 10 different techniques uh, in, in color uh, and material. And uh, each time the consistency of the glass was, was different. Uh, and for the black glass, for, uh, for example, usually when you're when you're blowing glass, you need to see the the bubble, uh, the the core uh, of it, and the glass needs to uh, around that bubble needs to be evenly distributed. Uh, it needs to be a, a very precise layer around it. And if it's not, when you blow it out, you'll get one side that's really thin, and the other side that will be very thick. Uh, um, so that's that's usually what happens with transparent glass. When you take uh, non-transparent glass, for example, which is usually used for a pressed glass, you simply cannot see the, the core, the, the, the bubble uh, within uh, the bulb. And then therefore, yeah, this uh, craftsman or the, the glass blower who has this experience of 35 years, he was actually trying to feel where the, the bubble was. Uh, and because he did it for such a long time, he guessed, uh, yeah, some of it uh, failed. But uh, most of it uh, succeeded, not so. And then, therefore, yeah, the, uh, um, these these molds that I found in the storage of the of the glass factory, uh, it's not used anymore. And there's the one guy who knows how to make those molds, still. When this guy's gone, and nobody in the Netherlands knows how to make those those one pair of wood molds anymore. They have this huge archive of, of all these molds, and I found even even more. They're being very, uh, yeah, how can I say, slightly obsessed about it. Uh, and if people can use it or not, and why, and should we do it, and, and so forth and so forth. I think I produced 120 or so in total, 10, 10 sets. And uh, yeah, they're, they're being exhibited, and it, uh, you, you have nice photos uh, for your catalogue. Um, and, and some of it is being sold. And I'm, I, I found this mold by, um, this old mold by uh, Willem Heese, which is this uh, old glass designer from the factory. And it, it was like an Indiana Jones uh, site in, in the basement of the factory. And I found this metal uh, mold and uh, said, well, you know, can I use it? Because then we can turn it into a product. Then we can turn the Royal Whip off idea and apply it to a real product that you can sell. Um, they didn't, um, it was too sensitive for, for them to use his particular mold. Yeah, this uh, plate is part of a set that was uh, designed in uh, the 1920s for the glass, mu glass factory uh, in Liedam. And uh, there's an original by Berlage, H.P. Berlage, from the Beurs van Berlage in Amsterdam. And uh, one of the people that worked for him was uh, Piet Swart. Uh, and Piet Swart standardized uh, this plate. And it was the first time ever in uh, history or so is that uh, yeah, these designers thought about how to standardize their design. This, this didn't happen before. So that the lid of the, the sugar pot would fit on the milk can huh? and, and so forth. Huh? So that you wouldn't have this, this whole array of unnecessary plates. And therefore this was uh, efficient because you only needed to have a limited amount of molds for, for it as well. And uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was celebrated. If you have the complete set, you can, uh, uh, yeah, live a good, live the good life. Huh? There are only a couple of sets um, 
uh, complete sets uh, available. And um, yeah, for, for this cup and paste, the, the Glass Museum asked me to, to design their museum year object. And then usually these are very artsy. Uh, and I was, yeah, it took me a long time, but I, I really fell in love with, uh, with pressed glass. And um, in the Netherlands, this is pressed glass stopped 40 years ago or so. So it's, it's a lost technique. I would say there's maybe one man or so. The machine is still in the factory, but there's maybe one man in Leerdam that still knows how to do it. Uh, so uh, yeah, I basically dove into the, the rich history of, uh, of Leerdam, uh, of the Leerdam factory on what happened at that time. And um, yeah. So, uh, and of course, I didn't know anything about pressed glass, and it wasn't possible here, or it would be possible here, but then there would be a 10,000 euro mold for, for these two. Uh, of course, and that uh, was, was uh, the, the, the budget uh, wasn't sufficient for that. So I simply started using existing designs that were made. So this ear is from uh, the Basel. This uh, cup is uh, made by uh, Kopier as a cactus uh, pot. Uh, and this uh, saucer is based on the plate by Beerlage. Uh, and I simply made the star in it. Uh. Um, so then therefore, I, yeah, I simply studied the form language of what could be possible in pressed glass and yeah, took that to my advantage, uh, combined it and uh, yeah, quite, I, I was quite surprised with the, the coherent um, result of it. And I did the, the entire thing by email. So I didn't touch any mold, didn't get dirty, just emailed with the Chinese to do this. Alibaba.com. So you can have everything made. Yeah, first you get a sample, and uh, yeah, there are many, many emails and many, many misunderstandings uh, along the way. So then, of course, there's the budget from the glass uh, museum. Then, yeah, the Chinese can say it's no problem, but of course, it's always a problem. They cannot say no, for, for example, which is a, a big problem. And uh, yeah, then you need to add pressure, uh, and um, yeah, I, I mean it's it's quite quite something that it uh, was actually realized. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's what I find intriguing as well is that there's this this form language or, or this sense of aesthetic that is not present uh, in contemporary Dutch design. Uh, I would say, well, you you cannot ask a Dutch designer. To, to come up with a design like, like this. Huh? So we're simply, because, a, a, yeah, I think I would say is that the main problem in it is that, it, that the cup or the saucer or the chair cannot be what, what, they, be, what, what they are, but they need to be a cup, a saucer, a chair, and so forth. Huh? Uh, the Glass Factory uh, had a big collection uh, of, of all this, this heritage and all these old produced pieces. Then from there on came the Glass Museum. Hmm? So, uh, it split uh, in two. And they, they still collaborate, uh, but uh, yeah, the Glass Factory in Lidam is a whole other story. But what the uh, uh, Glass Museum wants to do, and they have a glass blower facility as well, uh, is uh, collaborate with designers again. Uh, as was intended by Kochius, the old director of the glass factory in the 1920s or so. And the glass factory itself is not uh, picking up that role anymore, so the, the glass museum is doing so. So this was the, their first uh, in taking financial risk, what will happen. Of course, the, rise, the, the price had to, to, to get higher in order to, to break even. But from here on, uh, yeah, I'm working on a red series now. The mold is there and yeah, 2,000 pieces. I mean, how many you want? They, yeah, they, they make it, they send it to you and it, it can get sold. Yeah. Yeah, I started sketching <laughs> in uh, Paramaribo, where I taught for uh, seven, seven weeks. It's one of the former um, Dutch colonies. But uh, yeah, where I resisted to, to make any sketches or drawings uh, from the beginning, yeah? simply to make a point out of it is that it, that it should come out of this uh, set process. 
or the de uh, define process. I started uh, uh, sketching again, but uh, yeah, these these drawings only came from um, yeah utter boredom. As in, uh, for example, I I wouldn't imagine myself living in Amsterdam, getting too much distraction. Huh? I lived in Istanbul for some time. And I had a really good time there, but uh, nothing was popping up because I, I, I got distracted too much. Yeah. So, I mean, to, 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 yeah, to, to me, it, it works that you, you really need to take your yeah, solitude for, for some time. And you don't know what you're doing. You don't know where you're working at and yeah, stuff comes and goes. And then at some point uh, yeah, you, you can start, start working. And then we, we are within setting these processes, I, I can work quite fast. And then I'm, I'm still quite productive, even though I need to get bored. So these uh, phases are, uh, they, they don't have any uh, scale, huh? or they can, they can be anything. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm combining landscapes, artificial landscapes, giving it context uh, with, with these phases. Um, Yeah, Critter Mountain, uh, de uh, it's a, a Devil's Mountain from uh, <clears throat> Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out, uh, of course, yeah, these designs, you, know, you, you can copy them yourself, yourself quite easily, getting those measurements from the, from the books. And I'm... Uh, Mount Everest, I believe. Big Thunder Mountain. Devil's Mountain. And uh, The Sound of Music. Edelweiss, <laughs> also. So that's what I'm gonna work on now. <laughs> Do you have any idea how these might be realized? Or? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to make the, f the reproduce the files in, in MDF or laser cut it and then I'm going to get that blue foam and have fun uh, with it. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to the sound of music files. <laughs>